Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church. Thank you for joining us in Central Study Hour. We're grateful that you're joining us to learn the Word of God and praise Him together. Our first hymn request comes from Alan Fox of Bermuda. Alan requested him with title, Watch Ye Saints, as the hymnal number 598. This song reminds us to be watchful and be ready for Jesus' second coming. Let's sing, Watch Ye Saints, verse 1, 4, and 5. Saints with thy lamps waking, lo, the powers of heaven are shaking. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning, ready for your Lord's returning. Lo, he comes, lo, Jesus comes, lo, he comes, he comes all glorious. Jesus comes to reign victorious, lo, He comes, yes, Jesus comes. Nations wane, the proud and stately, Christ His kingdom hasteth greatly. Earth her latest pangs is summing, shout He saints, your Lord is coming, lo, He Jesus comes to reign victorious, lo, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Sinners now, what Christ is pleading, now for you he's interceding. Haste and grace and time diminished shall proclaim the mystery finished. Oh, he comes, lo, Jesus comes, lo, he comes, he comes all glorious, Jesus comes to reign victorious, oh, he comes, yes, Jesus comes. Keep your lamps all trimmed and burning, ready for your Lord's returning. Lo, He comes, He comes all glorious to reign victorious. Are you ready for His second coming? Thank you, Alan, for your hymn request that you sent us. If you have hymn request that you would like to share with us so we can sing together, please visit our website at sagcentral.org. Click contact us, then scroll down to CSH song request. Let us know your name, where you come from, and also the title of the hymn. We'll be happy to sing your hymn request on the upcoming Sabbath. Our second hymn request comes from Marcia Bruce of Jamaica. Marcia requested him with title We Know Not the Hour. This hymnal number 604, let's sing all three verses. Truth in the book of the Lord. 
Lord's revelation. Each prophecy points to the great consummation. But we know watch and be ready we'll watch and we'll pray we'll work and we'll wait till the master's re returning we'll sing and rejoice every omen discerning but we know not the hour let us pray dear heavenly father we're so grateful for all your blessings and your protection after upon us lord at this moment we would like to invite your Holy Spirit to guide us and inspire us so that we understand your will, Lord. Help us to be faithful until your second coming. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Central Study Hour will be presented by Pastor Mike Thompson. Lesson number eight, the New Testament. Hope I hope you have a blessed study. Well, it's good to see you all, and I'd like to welcome you as well to uh, Central Study Hour. Uh, the weeks fly as usual, and as uh, we just heard, we're on lesson number eight already. We get a new quarterly, we think, well, there's three months here, and yet <laughs> it's almost gone before we know it. But we're on lesson eight, and it's, it's a very fine lesson, and it is called The New Testament Hope. So glad you can join us. And I want to welcome those of you as well who are looking in today or listening. Um, before I proceed, I want to remind you again, you can have a free CD or a free DVD of today's presentation if you live in the continental United States. It's offer number C22247. C22247. If you call us at 916-457-6511, or email us at csh at saccentral.org. Uh, you can have one. And I'll repeat that at the end. I, uh, there's a memory verse which I'd like to begin by reading. It's uh, 1 John 5, 11 and 12. And this is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. Just as simple as that. Well, when I say simple, it's, it's simple in a sense, but very wondrously profound. And it, it says this, He who has the Son has life. He or she who does not have the Son does not have life. If you have Jesus, not just a name in your brain, if you will, but a divine being in your heart, you have eternal life. Uh, 
You may be a brand new Christian. Maybe you're a five minute uh, Christian, but you've opened your heart and Jesus has come in. There may be somebody who's had Jesus in their heart for 50 years. They've had a head start. They've had a chance for him to work in their lives and develop and polish their characters. You've just started. But you know what? If Jesus is in there, your name is in heaven, and even though you, you've got a lot of growing still to do, if your life is snuffed out in that moment, you're still saved. Jesus makes up for the deficiency with his own divine merit. So at every step of the process, if we're in him, it's not an excuse to mess up or deliberately, if you're in Christ, you are saved, you are safe. All right, uh, let me read something here from the introduction. It says, though writing in Greek, all the New Testament writers except Luke, uh, they were all Jews. And they, of course, approached the nature of human being from the holistic Hebrew perspective, not from the pagan Greek one. Uh, the pagan Greek, they believed in dualism. You know, you had a body and a spirit, and when you died, the spirit split off, your body decayed, but your soul went on to who knows where. Uh, that was a pagan Greek concept. That was not what the Hebrews believed. It was not in Scripture. Scripture teaches a holistic, not dualism, but a whole person. The whole person is physical. They have a mind. They have a body. They have a spirit in as much as we have a spiritual aspect. It's part of our, one of the dimensions that we have. And it's the whole person. When the whole person breathes their last, the whole person goes in to the grave. Not some little wisp uh, breaks off and goes up to heaven to be with God. It says, thus for Christ and the apostles, the Christian hope is not a new hope, but rather the unfolding of the ancient hope already nurtured by the patriarchs and the prophets. For example, Christ mentioned that Abraham foresaw and rejoiced to see his day. Abraham looked forward by faith to seeing Jesus come. Jude stated that Enoch prophesied about the second coming, Jude 14 and 15. And the book of Hebrews speaks about, now this is an important point here, the book of Hebrews speaks of the heroes of faith as having accepted a heavenly reward that they would not receive until we receive ours. In other words, when they died, they slept. They didn't go beforehand to enter into their reward before us. So the Bible clearly teaches soul sleep. And it says this statement would be meaningless if their souls were already with the Lord in heaven. Why, why have a resurrection, I ask you? By stressing that only those who are in Christ have eternal life, and John did that, 1 John 5, 11 and 12, which we just read, John disproved the theory of the natural immortality of the soul. Truly, there is no eternal life apart from the saving relationship with Christ. The New Testament hope, then, is a Christ-centered hope, and the only hope that this, mortal that this mortal existence will one day become an immortal one. All right, let's go on to uh, Sunday. I just want to begin again by reading the first paragraph here. Mentions an, an ancient Greek uh, historian, Herodotus. Uh, he wrote about, uh, in his culture, when somebody was born, when a child was born, there wasn't so much uh, a rejoicing in actual fact, they would have a period of mourning for the child. That, that, and in a sense, you know, I'm, I can understand it. We've got a wonderful little baby here, but, you know, it's been born in a dreadful, wicked, and nasty world. So they would actually mourn for the little one, for the things it was going to have to meet and endure during its lifetime, however long that might be. So there was some logic to that, you might, you might say. Um, and it's true. I mean, life is hard, um, even for Christians. Uh, but imagine what life, how, how much harder life is and would be if you come into this world and you don't have any relationship with God. You're just born into this dreadful, dreadful place here. 
Um, about the third paragraph down on Sunday, it says, um, more than one secular writer has commented on the meaningless of human existence. If you have this mindset, if you have this view of life, more than one secular writer has commented on the meaningless of human existence since we all not only die, but we also live with a realization that we are going to die. Imagine walking around with that all day in your brain and weighing on your heart. You know, all you have is this life, I'm gonna die one day. <laughs> what would you do without God, I ask you? But it says this, and this realization is what makes the whole project of human life, which is often hard and sorrowful in and of itself, seemingly null and void. And he mentions one person here with this attitude that um, symbolized human beings as just uh, rotting hulks of flesh. Hang on, I used to work in a butcher's shop, so I've seen some of that uh, when I was a Philistine. Rotting hulks of human flesh, and that's, that's the best you can hope for in the end. You just become rotten flesh. Which uh, reminds me, uh, some of you may have heard of some people, they believe in existentialism. Existentialism basically is this. Uh, you're born into a world which is meaningless. It, uh, your life is meaningless. The, uh, you, there's no intrinsic value in being born. So what you have to do if you're an ex ex existentialist, you have to make your own reason for being alive. Why am I here? Well, I better make up some reason why I'm here, you know. What a vain way of looking at life and what a vain way of trying to process life. It's just dreadful. You know, there's, um, there's some people even try to bring Christianity into this concept of existentialism. Anyway, we, we won't go there. It just boggles, just boggles my mind. So, uh, but that's how some people are. Uh, then it says in the very last paragraph, of course, in contrast to all this, we have the biblical promise of eternal life in Jesus. So do you want to be an existentialist and just try and make your own reason for being alive, try and mean something to you? No, no, you can keep that, thank you. We're here for a reason. We're not just a random bunch of atoms which from the standpoint of evolution, we kind of suddenly appeared and came into this world. We are sons and daughters of God Almighty through Jesus Christ. We are somebody, and we are heading somewhere, not just some dull plate. We are on our way to the kingdom of glory. So what a contrast. And this is the key. We have this hope in Jesus. Remember what it says there, he who has the Son has life, he who doesn't have the Son has not life. It's just as simple as that. But if we have Jesus, and uh, what is death? Why should we worry about death when we've got this glorious resurrection awaiting us? So we have a tremendous hope. Anyway, um, looking beyond the hope of this life, we, we have the promise there from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which... Um, I want to read, or at least some of it. Uh, well, I will. I'll read verses 12 through 19. And uh, this is usually, or should be read at every Seventh-day Adventist funeral. It says this, verse 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, okay, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? His reasoning here, of course, with the Corinthians, they're, they're new Christians. Um, they were, come from a, a Jewish background, though there would, there would be some Jews among them. He says, how can we uh, speak about a resurrection if, uh, if somebody doesn't believe in a resurrection? It's a non-starter, right? But then he goes on here. He says, but if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Now, if we don't believe in a resurrection of the dead, did Jesus die or didn't he? Was it just some fairy tale? You can't have it both ways. Well, we know he rose from the dead. Verse 14, then he says this, and if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and our faith is also vain. So if Jesus didn't rise, I should go back and make tents, 
because my preaching means it's just vain words. It doesn't mean anything because it did mean anything because Paul was preaching the truth. And, um, and let me move down to verse 16. It says, for if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And he, we can't, he's kind of repeating that, what he said a little further up in the passage. Then he says this, verse 17, and if Christ be not raised, then your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Now, wait a minute. Now, somebody believed, uh, a lot of Christians believe that when Jesus died on the cross, he accomplished everything for us. He died on the cross, uh, so we have eternal life. But you see, the gospel encompasses more than what Jesus did on the cross, right? He died on the cross, he shed his blood, but the gospel is ineffective unless he rose to ascend to heaven, to intercede before God for us and minister the blood that he shed upon the cross, right? That's all pictured in the Old Testament sanctuary system, you see. Um, now, some people uh, criticize us as some of the Adventists for believing that, but hey, well, you know, look at the sanctuary. It's a storybook of salvation, how God is going to save us from having broken the law. And you've got the sacrifice in the courtyard, and you've got the priest ministering the blood of the sacrifice in the, um, in the sanctuary. And the Bible speaks of Christ being the sacrifice, is the paschal lamb, and yet at the same time, especially in Hebrews, is also the high priest pleading not the blood of bulls and goats, but his own blood. I'm sorry, but you have to take both aspects to get the full picture of the gospel here. So the point is, if Jesus had not risen from the dead, even though he died for us, if he hadn't gone to heaven and risen from the dead to plead his blood, it wouldn't have done any good. He couldn't have made an atonement for us. But he did rise, so praise God. Yeah. And then he says this, uh, well, he said, verse 17, if Christ isn't raised, your faith is vain, you're in your sins. Then verse 18, then they also which have fallen asleep in Jesus, they're perished because he didn't rise. Then he says, verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, just a hope, but no surety that he rose to intercede, then we are of all men and women most miserable. It's, it's a hope that mocks us and teases us, don't you think? Okay, let me move on here. So I read that, yes. And uh, the question which I should have read first, he says, what is Paul saying here about how closely related Christ's resurrection is to the hope of our own resurrection? Well, we just read it. If he didn't rise, we won't rise. But he did. Uh, and also uh, in the lesson, it's got 1 Corinthians 15, 32, which says, if the dead do not rise, then let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. You just party in this life, that's it. You know, um, my mother used to tell me she was alive in the Second World War, and she said this was a saying then, you know, with soldiers and airmen who would go over on uh, missions over Germany, bombing, a lot of them didn't come back, you know, come back, let's eat, drink, and be merry, you know, for tomorrow we die. Um, not a good situation to be in. How many of them knew Jesus? I appreciate their bravery, but how many of them, how many of them knew Jesus, you know? Um, but he knows. Uh, let me read the last uh, paragraph. If our present existence as carbon-based protoplasm did you know that's what you are? Yes, Ray. Ray, you are carbon-based protoplasm. Does your wife know that? <laughs> yeah, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus took the car carbon-based protoplasm, but he made you a wonderful husband out of it. So uh, it's, all, it's all good, Ray. Uh, but if that's all we are, and if that's all there is, and our three score and 10 years, if we make it that way, and he says, if you eat too many hamburgers and whatever else, you may not make it that long. Uh, if that's all we get, then we're in pretty rough shape. Would you agree with that? A little statement from Ellen White, she says, heaven is worth everything to us. And if we lose heaven, we lose all. You know, along with the existentialists who have their own um, mindset there. You know, there, there are those people, secularists, if you will, 
They think it's a sign of their superior uh, intellect to mock the idea of a divine being. They mock the idea uh, of God. And um, they take pride in their superior rationalism. You know, I'm not foolish enough to believe these fairy stories from the Bible. You know, I've, um, I'm highly educated. I, I, not for me, thank you very much. But you know, these people with their superior intellect, one day I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. They're going to be drastically and horrifically surprised and extremely humiliated to realize that this concept of a God that they mocked is a real, live, righteous, holy being. And um, they're going to see him in all his glory and then uh, they're going to be so painfully realized that they weren't so smart and wise after all, right? What an end. What an end to a life of, of uh, self-centeredness uh, and foolishness. Okay, let's move on to Monday. I will come again. Do you believe that? Amen. Yes, yes. That's why we're Seventh-day Adventists. We go to church on the seventh day. We worship on the seventh day as a recognition that we were created by Jesus. And also the fact we're Adventists, we believe in his second coming. So we are looking for that. And we've been saying it a long time. And if, if, uh, if we as a people, uh, uh, being faithful, were ere this, to use the term of the prophet, ere this, we would have been in the kingdom of God. And he said that toward the end of the 1800s. But still, he's still coming. Uh, there's a question here. Um, well, actually, let, let me read John uh, 14, first of all. John 14, 1 through uh, 3. Remember those words there? Jesus said, um, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Or in some versions it says many rooms. In my Father's house are many rooms. Um, if it were not so, I would have told you. But it is so. I'm using my own paraphrase here. I'm interjecting a little bit. This is why he says, I go to prepare a place here. He says, I'm going to prepare one of those rooms for you. Then, verse 3, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come what? I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Amen, Elsa. Amen indeed. So the question here following that is, it has been almost 2,000 years since Jesus promised to come again. How can we help others see that despite the great length of time, which really doesn't matter, and we'll look at why in a moment, though we should understand this, that despite the great length of time, this promise is relevant even to our generation, so long removed from the time Jesus, it's relevant to us as I'm coming soon. I believe that. Um, and the reason we should believe that he's coming soon is he's promised. And does he keep his promise? Can you depend upon his promises? Absolutely you can. It says four times in the book of Revelation, Jesus stated, I am coming soon, Revelation 3, 11, 22, 7, 22, 12, 22, 20. And the book of Revelation ends almost, almost the last verse. I'm, I'm coming, even so come, come Lord Jesus. Um, so yes, indeed. And it was this promise of Jesus, I will come again. It drove the apostolic church to the, to the corners of the earth, if you will, within one generation. Paul was able to say in Colossians, this God, was it Galatians? I forget which. This gospel has been preached to every creature under heaven. No time. It drove them out there. He's coming. We have a world to warn. And they warned it uh, indeed. And so uh, down in the second paragraph, it says, and this promised event 
And this promised event has not yet occurred. Okay, 2,000 years ago, they took the Bible to the ends of the earth. It still hasn't happened. And so many are inquiring, you know, um, well, how much longer are we going to have to preach that Jesus is coming soon? Have these words generated an unrealistic expectation? I don't think so. I know neither do you as well. He cites in here the, the, the uh, verse from 2 Peter. He says there, where is the promise of his coming? The scoffers, you know. Where is the promise of his coming? You know, so since the fathers all, you know, fell asleep, all things continue as they have from the beginning. So where is this? Mockingly, you can hear the mock. So where is this promise of his coming? Well, uh, Jesus said it, and so we can believe it. Um, about three years ago, Helen and I went over to England and um, we went to see some friends we hadn't seen for over 50 years. Um, I used to be in a band with, uh, with, with one of them. Nice people, uh, very nice people. Um, they became Adventists for a little while. But uh, we visited them and uh, we, we're getting ready to leave the house, you know, after we've had this little reunion. And uh, one of the family turned to me and said, um, do you still believe what you used to believe like 50 years ago? <laughs> and I said, trust me, I believe it now more than ever before. Amen. I do. 50 years, it hasn't got time. It's, it's got brighter as far as, I'm, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the thing that really matters is, uh, well, I, I, but still it's a problem for some people, you know, well, what's happening? And Jesus highlighted this in the parable of the ten virgins, remember? They were waiting for the bridegroom coming. They were, they were there, the ten virgins, they had their lamps, and uh, they got a little weary, and they thought, well, maybe, it's, maybe all things continued as they did from the beginning, you know? Well, actually, they still believed in it, but they got sleepy. They got weary. And they slumbered and they slept and then the call was made at midnight. Behold, the bridegroom cometh. And they woke up and five of them were wise enough to have gotten extra oil for their lamps. So their lamps didn't go out. You remember the story? And five of them, they still believed in his coming, but, you know, they hadn't prepared. And they go to the other, give us some of your oil. No, we can't. You'll have to go get it yourself. And in this particular instance, uh, one of the applications of the oil is its character. So it's like running to somebody who's ready for the second coming of Jesus and you've kind of let things go and you run to them. Please give me some of your character, please. You can't do that, can you? No, you just can't do it. You've got to get the oil yourself. You've got to go purchase it. Who do you purchase the oil from? From Jesus. The oil is a symbol of the Spirit as well. It's a symbol of grace. So you go to Jesus, he'll give you the oil. But he knew that people, there'd be probably more than what we realize, would get sleepy and slumbery and, and a, a treacherous uh, state of mind to be in. But anyway, what really matters is the biblical promise that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. We're reading here from, uh, from the lesson, 2 Peter 3, 9. Uh, Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for everyone to come to repentance. And that's true, he's merciful. But at the same time, he wants us to get on, right? Get the message out, let him grow our characters. Uh, but while, the, while things are going on, the Lord is... He's still saving people. He wants as many still to be saved. I'm reading in uh, the little paragraph, still in the same long paragraph here. It says, despite the long centuries since Jesus ascended, the promise of his coming remains relevant even today. And there's a question there. It says, why? And the answer is, because all that we have is our own short life. Yes. Followed by an unconscious rest in the grave. Yes. Then the final resurrection without any later opportunity to uh, change our destiny. So whether you lived uh, 500 years ago and you're waiting for Jesus to come, you lasted, let's say, three score years and 10, you went in the grave. 
Well, if you're 100 years after that, you're waiting for Jesus to come. You, all you waited was for three score years and 10, and you went in the grave. So, you know, nobody waits longer than anybody else. But yeah, I understand we're looking back 2,000 years and we're thinking, come on, Lord, please, please come. Uh, something else that's not in the lesson, but I thought I would just briefly mention here. Uh, there is a reason why uh, Jesus um, didn't come back, say, 500 years ago or 200 years ago. You know, in 2 Thessalonians, it gives us a heads up there that there would be a period of time before Jesus would actually come. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. And Paul is speaking here of the coming of, of, the, of the Lord. He says, let no man, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, it's supplied here, but the context makes clear that it's the coming of Christ. For that day shall not come except there come a falling away first. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped in the temple of God, sorry, or that is worshipped, show that he, as God, professing to be God, sits in the temple of God, symbolically the church, showing himself that he is God. Who is this? This is the little, this is the, the little horn. He's speaking here of what Daniel spoke about 600 years before, thereabouts. Daniel 7, Daniel saw the little horn power, which was the rise of the Roman papacy. And there, there, that ties into the 1260 uh, year prophecy, 538 to 1798. So Jesus would not have come before 1798. And then there's another time prophecy as well, given in Daniel chapter 8, which takes us beyond 1798, which makes it clear that Jesus still wouldn't have come. 2300 year prophecy, when did that end? 457 BC, it ended in what year? 1844, right? So uh, God knew there'd be a delay. God had determined there would be a delay in the second coming of Christ. But after 1844, you can read um, that that's when Jesus entered the most holy place to begin the investigative judgment. It was the antitypical beginning of the antitypical day of atonement. When Jesus entered that, as we know, a work of investigation, it was the pre-advent judgment that began, that was initiated. And uh, it was not too long, well, the Adventist church came in officially in 1863, but it wasn't much beyond that. Ellen White wrote, and uh, she said, ere this, if we had been, I'm using my own, own words, if we'd been faithful after 1844, the Lord would have been here. So yes, we are in a tarrying time now that, that there's no need for. There's no need for this tarrying time, but we're still here. So we're the reason why the Lord is tarrying. So we need to look in. I need to look in and say, Lord, what am I doing or not doing that is delaying your perfecting of my character, if you will, the polishing of my character? And what am I doing that is delaying your coming to this world? You've got some heart searching to do. But still, Jesus will come. I was going to say whether we're alive or not. I hope so. I, I, I want to see Jesus come, don't you? Yeah. I mean, if I go before he comes, I won't know anything, but I want to see him come. Now, I don't want to get off the lesson too much, but as we know, there's going to be a special resurrection for those who die in the third angel's message, right? So before the general resurrection, Jesus will, Michael, up you come. You know, you read the great contract. I did, Lord. Well, you can watch, you can watch the coming of Jesus. I understand that. See all that. Wow, isn't that amazing? <laughs> oh, yes, indeed. Uh, so anyway, uh, so that's why uh, he, he, he will definitely come. And we already mentioned, if in the meantime you pass away, it's a twinkling of an eye and, uh, and Jesus will be here. I, I need to move on. There's more I could say there, but I need to be moving on here. Tuesday, I will raise him up. 
uh, top uh, paragraph, in one of his miracles, Jesus fed 5,000 people with just a small amount of bread and fish. Perceiving that the multitude then intended to proclaim him king, Jesus sailed with his disciples to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. But the next day, the multitude followed him there, where he delivered his powerful sermon, do you remember, on the bread of life, with special emphasis on the gift of everlasting life. You remember he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood and... So, oh, that was... They, they didn't... They didn't catch he was speaking spiritually. Uh, they could have done. But not only that, they realized that he wasn't there to proclaim himself an earthly king. If you wanted to follow him, uh, there was a cross to carry. And they weren't so much interested in that. So as you know, a lot of them, uh, they, they just turned away. They just turned away. And uh, Jesus turned to them as well, uh, to his disciples. He says, will you also go away? What did Peter say? Lord, where can we go? He says, you have the words of eternal life. <laughs> There's nothing apart from you. So Peter got it. Praise the Lord. But let's look at uh, John 6. Um, it says verses 26 through 51. We, we don't have time to uh, look at all that. But it says, how did Jesus associate the gift of everlasting life with the final resurrection of uh, of the righteous. So I'm going to go to John 6 here when I can find it very quickly. Just bear with me. John 6. Um, okay, I want to read um, verse 39. Well, further up, he says in verse 33, he says, speaking of the bread of God which has come down from heaven and gives life to the world. Um, which, which is what Jesus did in verse 35. He said, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes on me shall never thirst. So the, the lesson points out three things as well. I want to still read a bit in here, but if you go down to the first big paragraph, second big paragraph, it says, in his sermon, Jesus highlighted three basic concepts in regard to eternal life. First, he identified himself as the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So he is the one that actually gives life, okay? Um, it says, uh, still in the second paragraph, Jesus explained that everlasting life can be secured in him. He says, he who comes to me in 6.35, I just read that, didn't I? He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believes in me shall never thirst. But there's also um, point number three. It says, finally, if you can see that, finally, Jesus linked the gift of immortality with a final resurrection, assuring his audience three times, I will raise him up at the last day. Let's look at verse um, 40 in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, John 6. Jesus said, And this is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. And then we'll go to 54, where Jesus also said then, he said, Whosoever eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Verse 40 especially, I can um, sometimes understand, or maybe some people don't get understand this. It says, Jesus said, Everyone that sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life. And some people think it's fair to say, they think, well, I have, do I have? Yeah, you have the gift. I have everlasting life. So if I die and I have everlasting life, then surely that means I go straight to heaven. But Jesus is saying he'll raise me up at the last day. So how does this work? 
when Jesus, when you come to Jesus, I've used this before as an analogy. When you come to Jesus, you invite him, Lord, take my life. He comes into your heart, you're born again. You receive the gift of everlasting life, right? You got it. You have the gift. But you're not resurrected until he comes, which may be a bunch of years after, right? Do I have, sure you have the gift. You receive the gift, but you open the gift when he resurrects you. So you have the gift, right? You ever had a Christmas present as a child? Two weeks before Christmas, it's under the tree. Uh, sorry, maybe I'm not supposed to talk about Christmas here. <laughs> Looking at my past. Uh, Oh, it used to be tough. I used to know where my presents were. I knew, I knew where they all were. I used to sneak them out. And uh, uh, yeah, I was a little monkey. Uh, but anyway, you know, there's a present under the tree. And oh, it's got your name written on it. And it's big, beautiful paper, big wrapping stuff. And you shake it, you smell it. It's heavy. You think, ooh, ooh, I've got that gift. Do you really? You won't get it till Christmas Day. No, but I have it. Little kids have more faith than we have, don't they? They know they've got the gift. And so eternal life is like that. You've got the gift and you open it when Jesus comes. All right, didn't mean to uh, labor the point too much there. Um, okay, so let me move down to the last paragraph here. Um, the picture is clear. Without Christ, one does not have eternal life. But even after accepting Christ and having the assurance of eternal life, we continue for now being mortal and therefore subject to natural death. At the second coming, Jesus will resurrect us and then there he will give us the gift which we've had all along. But it'll, it'll be unwrapped, the gift of immortality. And it says here that it was ours already. The gift is assured. So praise the Lord that Jesus is our righteous one and we are righteous and have life in him. Uh, moving on to Wednesday, at the sound of the trumpet. Yeah, the, uh, the, the Thessalonians, um, the first century Christians, uh, brand new Christians, they, they understood that, that, uh, if the, that Jesus was coming again, but they had this idea that if you died before his second coming, you wouldn't be resurrected. You wouldn't have eternal life. So it was really troubling them. Uh, this, is why Paul, this is why Paul wrote to them. And he says, I would not have you to be ignorant concerning them which are asleep. You're familiar with that passage. Anyway, this is what Ellen White said about the, uh, from Acts of the Apostles, page 258, speaking of the uh, Thessalonians. She said, they had carefully guarded the lives of their friends lest they should die and lose the blessing which they looked forward to receiving at the coming of their Lord. But one after another, their loved ones had been taken from them. And with anguish, just imagine, they really believe this. With anguish, the Thessalonians had looked for the last time upon the faces of their dead, hardly daring to hope to meet them in the future life. That was real to these dear souls. So you can imagine Paul his heart must have been touched. So he wrote to them those uh, well-known words in First uh, Thessalonians, which I'm going to read right now on this too. Uh, should be read at every, well, it doesn't have to be, but you know, every Seventh-day Adventist, True Blue Seventh-day Adventist funeral or memorial service. Verse 13, First Thessalonians 4, 13. He says, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. He says, I want you to know the truth so that you don't sorrow of those who have no hope. He says, you've got hope. Let me explain why here. Then he goes in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, which he did, even so, them which have fallen asleep, which have died in Jesus, will he bring with him? We'll get back to that phrase there, bring with him in a moment. 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, we, the, we that live, to see Jesus come, shall not precede them to heaven with him before those who have fallen asleep. They're going to come back as well. And he tells them this in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them uh, in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. That's why he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. It's all good. That must have been a, a, a delight for them to realize that, don't you think? So uh, praise God for that. There's a statement on uh, Friday, which I want to read here. It's from Acts of the Apostles 259, pale and white. She says, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. She says this, many interpret this passage to mean that the sleeping ones will be brought with Christ from heaven like disembodied, uh, disembodied spirits that come down to be united with their physical body. That's nowhere in Scripture, but there's people believe that. Many interpret this passage to mean that the sleeping ones will be brought from heaven with Christ. But Paul meant that as Christ was raised from the dead, so God will call the sleeping saints from their graves and take them, to him, take them with him to heaven. Precious consolation, glorious hope, not only to the church of Thessalonica, but to all Christians, wherever they may be. Thursday, the everlasting encounter. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 55. What mystery is Paul explaining here? Top paragraph, it says, some popular preachers suggest that this mystery is the secret rapture of the church, which is to occur seven years prior to Christ's glorious second coming. Let me tell you, this seven years, it's, uh, it's really a crime. Um, the 70 week prophecy, which is spelled out in Daniel 9, which is part of the 2300 year prophecy, that 70 week prophecy is broken up. And the last prophetic section, which is seven uh, prophetic days or seven literal years, that last week, those seven years, in there you've got this tremendous, wondrous, exciting evidence that Jesus truly was the Messiah because he fulfilled that. The Messiah was to come. The Messiah means anointed one. And according to that prophecy, the 70 weeks and the last seven weeks of that, the Messiah was to become right, right at the beginning of that, which would have been A.D. 27. And who comes along in fulfillment of that very prophecy? But Jesus comes and he's baptized in the Jordan and he receives the Holy Spirit. He's anointed. Messiah means anointed one. So Jesus fulfills that right at the beginning of that, 70, of that seven week prophecy. And it says there in Daniel, in the midst of the week, shall Messiah be cut off. That would take us part way through to 27 to AD 31, right? Somewhere in the, in the middle of that last prophetic week. And when was Jesus crucified? AD 31, right in the middle of that last section of prophetic time. Tremendous. And yet, believe it or not, the devil with no warrant uh, and the last three and a half years was time allotted to the Jews. As a nation, it was their last three and a half years of probation. The devil comes along and he chops that right off. And instead of applying it to Jesus, he throws it off into the future and applies it to the Antichrist. Can you believe that? A lot of people do. And that's where we get this, uh, <laughs> this rapture theory from. Because, anyway... So during the seven years, there's seven years of tribulation. So if you, if, you, if you miss the secret rapture, which is supposed to take place at the beginning of that seven year period, if you miss that, and people are supposedly just raptured from their cars and raptured out of their bed, walking down the street, just whisked away. You've seen pictures of that. But if you miss that, the Antichrist is gonna make an appearance Something he's going to sit behind a big computer in Brussels or something like that. He's going, to, he's going to do all kinds of things. But if you miss the secret rapture, you've got seven more years and you can be ready for Jesus's. What would, what would amount to be his third coming? You can be ready for his third coming at the end of the seven years. 
It's all just a deception of the devil. Uh, but anyway, that's what some people believe. But it won't work like that. It says the mystery Paul is referring to is simply the transformation of the living righteous to join the resurrected righteous at Christ's second coming. This is a mystery. God's going to glorify those who are living. That's a mystery. It's a miracle of the Holy Spirit. And the second part of the mystery is through his power, he's going to raise the dead. Wow. That's the mystery he's talking about, not some secret rapture seven years before his second coming. So it says there is no secret rapture because the second coming will be visible to all living human beings. Revelation 1, 7. Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him, right? So uh, it says in this one third paragraph, it says um, it'll, every, it'll be seen by every human being and both the resurrection of, of the dead and the transformation of the living ones will occur at the sound of the trumpet of Christ's return. So I will conclude, there's a statement from Great Controversy 645 at the bottom of Thursday's page. It says, little children, oh, it's just speaking about this when Jesus comes and there's a resurrection, little children who have passed away. Little children are born by holy angels to their mother's arms. Imagine that. What's that gonna be like for mommy? You know, here's your little baby. Oh, that angel's gonna love putting that little baby in mommy's arms again. Friends long separated by death are united, never more to part, and with songs of gladness are sent together to the city of God. Great controversy, six, four, five. Praise God for that. Well, I just want to tell you again, friends, you can have a, a free CD or a DVD of today's presentation. It's often number C22247, C22247. Call us at 916-457-6511 or email us at csh at sexcentral.org. And God bless you, and we will, by the grace of God, we'll see you all next week for Central Study Hour.